the Intercity 125, a British design classic. Even today, when I see one, I'm pleased to be getting on that train. I think it's a beautiful machine. It still holds the world speed record for diesel. It's sleek, there's no question about it. It looks like the thing's actually moving, even when it's sitting still. Each of these high-speed trains has clocked up more than 9 million miles. That's 19 trips to the moon and back. I do get a kick out of driving a big train at 125 mile an hour. After more than 40 years, the 125s are now being replaced by newer foreign models. But our love affair with the 125 is far from over. The 125 is still, to this day, the standard by which other trains are measured. It's time to celebrate this shining beacon of British engineering genius. Suddenly, you've got a train that was designed to be a train, an entity. But the 125 is more than just a train. It's a homegrown hero with a secret history. For this great British success story to triumph, it had to overcome some formidable foes. Defiant unions. People who were driving trains day in, day out said, not on your life. Violent football hooligans. I decided, having watched football most of my life, I didn't want to ever see it again. And even the soggy British Rail sandwich. It's a cheese sandwich on white bread, and I think they were stale before they were even ever got on the train. The press used to say that I'd been hired to uncurl the British Rail sandwich. The 125 beat them all. And if you're travelling long distance by train in Britain today, chances are you're still on a 125. But now new foreign trains are finally replacing the 125s, and many will miss them. It's Heather's job to shunt them into the maintenance shed. She's got quite a thing for the 125. Oh, I love them. They're just, there's so much character to them. When you're driving it, you really feel like you're driving a train. You're not sort of sat in some, playing a video game or something. You can feel the power they've got. You can feel the characteristics. Each one's different to drive. Each one's got different tweaks and that. But yeah, it's, they are really fun. These will take anything on. Snow, floods, you know, they'll keep going. I come from a railway background. Um, so I grew up around trains a lot. And then um, when I left university, I got a job working on board, serving teas and coffees, but I knew I wanted to come and drive them. And I get to shunt as well, which is the fun part. The 125 was only ever meant to be a stopgap train. Instead, it ended up saving Britain's railways. So how did that happen? To find out, we need to go back to the 60s, a time when our railways were on the brink of extinction. I mean, there were actually propositions around that the railways might just actually be closed down. Some countries in the world did actually close their railways in the 60s and 70s. It's something that was great in the 19th century, but now we have the car, now we have the, the aeroplane. Maybe let's just forget about the railways. Is it any wonder they were thinking of getting rid of trains entirely? Until 1968, British Rail was still running steam trains, while at the same time, British Airways was testing Concorde. Pop mogul Pete Waterman is a first-hand witness to the sorry state of Britain's railways. Back then, he helped drive a steam train. Trains were running late, didn't turn up. They were also dirty. Some of the rolling stock was 70 to 80 years old. Ruth Goodman joined British Rail after university. I worked for a couple of years as a ticket clerk on a commuter station in the middle of nowhere. And she was all too familiar with the out-of-date trains. I was used to the old diesel slam door stock. You were in compartments, they were quite old and rather worn, and they stank of cigarette smoke. In fact, for many people, the 60s and 70s were grim. Whenever I see it on the telly, we get this sort of jazzed-up, rosy-tinted, rich people's version 
of the 60s and 70s, and I, I certainly don't remember much of that. Come on, Ruth, it wasn't all doom and gloom. You could catch some great kids telly like Tis Was. Oh, sorry, that's Blue Peter. Oh, yes, they had a bit of a thing for trains. I'm sure you can guess from that that this isn't the original locomotion, and you'd be right. I've always liked trains. And, of course, we had a Blue Peter locomotive, which was called Blue Peter, which we renamed in Doncaster. And we'll all be back on... But while children's TV is going through a golden age, Britain's railways face a crisis. It was actually more convenient to drive than to go by train. Train was not an option that you would choose, so we, we drove literally everywhere. It was dirty, old-fashioned, it was labour-intensive. I mean, it was appalling. Nobody cared. Who would want to travel on the kind of trains that we had then? And so people didn't. Used to sorting out half-baked ideas, even celebrity chef Prue Leith is shocked when she joins the board of British Rail. What surprised me was how people disparaged the railways. They hated the railways. Um, you know, there were constant jokes. The British public thought the railways were, were dreadful. New and glamorous, domestic air travel is growing rapidly. But it's the new motorways that are most attractive to travelling Brits. By the early 70s, there are 19 million cars on the road. The car is king, and the fate of Britain's railways hangs in the balance. Forty-odd years ago, it looked like our railways were on the way out. To save them, British Rail needed a high-tech solution. Britain's genius with science and technology had produced groundbreaking marvels like the hovercraft and supersonic planes like Concorde. See, the great thing about Britain is that we all forget we are brilliant as a little nation with technology. Brilliant. But we didn't have a high-speed train. France was investing in new locomotives, new trains, new routes, wholesale infrastructure improvement. The country that invented the railway is lagging behind. The big development, of course, was the establishment of the world's first high-speed train in Japan. It ran at you know, 150, 180 miles an hour uh, on dedicated tracks. You know, there was that iconic picture of the bullet train next to Mount Fuji. So other countries maybe were doing better than we were. When you looked up and you saw what they were doing in France, what they were doing in Japan, you know, I mean, they were taking railways to new heights, doing new and very exciting things, making whole new systems, and we were, we were doing nothing. There was a good reason we didn't have a British bullet train. Our railway lines are too bendy. Britain's Victorian railways were built in the 1840s for much slower trains. Plus, back then, the engineers would avoid any steep hills. Result, a railway full of bends and curves. The West Coast was built by Stevenson as a very curving route. It's almost one continuous S-bend all the way to Scotland, and you wouldn't have got much more than 100 miles an hour on that route. And a lot slower in places. The line that I'm going to travel on is around a very sharp curve and there's a speed restriction of 20 miles an hour around the whole of the curve. You can't just start cutting off corners of, of train tracks and corners of Britain cities. It was just impossible. People now lived in the places you want to put new train tracks. Even if you could persuade homeowners to move, there's no money to lay new tracks in straight lines. British Rail had a problem. It only had a finite pot of money. They had to decide where to invest that money. Do you invest in something which is going to be just the new stock to cope of the old uh, rail network, or do you invest wholesale in a complete new system? So, to wrangle this problem in 1964, British Rail set up a research centre in Derby and hired a team of top boffins to work there. Contrary to what many people think, British Rail was actually a very innovative organisation. 
and it was uh, a completely integrated operation. So it ran the trains, it actually developed trains, it built trains. So it called in kind of engineers from different sectors like uh, aeronautics and said, you know, how do we do this? Rolls-Royce had gone through a sticky period and Rolls-Royce were based in Derby and a number of Rolls-Royce engineers moved over to British Rail Research on the APT team. So there was totally new thinking there compared with the traditional railway thinking. This was new, new uh, cutting edge technology and it was mainly people by people who come from outside the rail industry and didn't have this desire to evolve what was there before. To save itself from financial ruin, British Rail bet everything on a simple formula. For every one mile an hour gained in speed, rail revenue would increase by 1%. Speed would win back passengers and save Britain's railways. But British Rail's main engine is the Deltic, a heavyweight diesel loco. Deltics, for example, this Class 55, these great big racehorses on the East Coast Main Line, the old technology, they weren't going to cut it. They were too heavy. They couldn't go any faster. They were just too heavy to go really, really fast. The diesel trains are running at about 90 or 100 miles an hour, and the Japanese were already going at 200 miles an hour by that stage, so we had to do something. The boffins at Derby start work on designing a brand new kind of train. Kit Spackman had joined the team from the motor industry. The research and development department uh, was relatively new, but was learning new things at the time, um, and was very much at the front end of railway technology then. We really saw this as the big white hope of the future and the air analogy, I guess, was Concorde. It was going to go at 150 miles an hour on test, it was going to be gas turbine powered, and it, was, it felt like an aeroplane on rails. It was incredibly innovative. Nothing else like this had been developed anywhere in the world. The big challenge is to cut journey times without slowing down through the curves. If you're on a high-speed train that's tilting into a curve, you do require that extra tilt because the centrifugal force is pulling you, and that extra tilt is required to try and normalise some of that experience as, as a human being going around that corner. Otherwise, it's pretty hideous. It was very steeply graded and some very, very sharp curves. Now, the, the trains would have to slow down from, say, a nominal 125 miles an hour for the curves because otherwise the passengers would go out through the window. Instead of rebuilding the tracks without curves, Kit Spackman devises a groundbreaking solution. Build a train that can tilt around corners. Sensors would activate hydraulic jacks to automatically tilt the train at just the right angle to suit the speed on the curve. On a motorcycle, you automatically take up the correct angle to go around the corner. Um, and doing that with a train would seem to be a, a logical progression. This innovative new project, the first of its kind in the world, is called the Advanced Passenger Train, or APT. Everything that had to be done at that period to produce the Advanced Passenger Train was new. Um, we were talking about running the train 50% faster than was running at present time. <laughs> Within a year, Kit has mocked up this prototype tilting train. It can tilt a carriage to nine degrees in one second. Testing it on a track running parallel to the A74 road in Scotland, Kit decides to take on a sports car at speed. There was a guy looking from the lay-by on the A74 to right alongside, looking over the top of us, and uh, he was in a Porsche 928. Um, um, we got the green and everybody dived back into the train and sort of off we went. And this guy took off down the A74 towards the south and was somewhat surprised a short while later by this Bailey Bridge on wheels whistling past him at a considerably faster speed than he was, with this guy standing on the outside taking a photograph of him as he went past. <laughs> but was Kit's tilting train fast enough? British Rail was desperate to challenge air travel from London to Scotland. We just had to beat the airlines. The airlines were about an hour to London. We were about five hours, so the advanced passenger train was a big hope. 
It seems Kit and the APT team are on the right track. They set about testing every part of it to destruction. Everything about it was completely brand new, so almost nothing from previous years went forward. And, of course, the fundamental thing was the fact that the darn thing had to be stable on the track. But management want instant results. We were expecting this wonderful infant to be born and perform perfectly immediately, and we didn't realise how radical it was. Almost all the ingredients on the advanced passenger train were clever and were needed, but to put them all on the same prototype in one go, put it on the tracks and expect it to work, was asking too much. The network is crying out for its high-speed train, but the APT tilting train project is taking far too long. British Rail had pumped all this money into the APT on one side, but also started to put money into other projects too. And there was real concern within British Rail itself that actually this wasn't the right way forward. We're looking at a brand new future, a brave new world of rail travel that might never pay off. Looking on from the sidelines at this very moment is a rival group of engineers. They don't have degrees in aeronautics, but they do know how trains work, and they have a plan to save Britain's railways. There were two teams at Derby. One was the advanced passenger train, you know, and their aeronautical engineers and these boffins in white coats and their Thunderbird train, and those who are being developing stuff that have been developed in the past and just evolving it slightly. And uh, many of them were quite upset that these new sort of fangled people coming from the air industry were coming in and stepping on their turf. You know, this wasn't their land. They belonged up in the sky at the airports. What are they doing on the railways? The advanced passenger train teams tended to be new engineers from outside the rail industry with new ideas, and the high-speed team tended to be inside the industry, evolving traditional ideas. The Intercity 125 engineers who uh, were, quote, real railway, unquote, rather thought uh, we lot over there were uh, upstarts and um, coming from the aerospace and the motor industry as we did, we knew absolutely nothing about railways. British Rail has its own in-house team of engineers with years of experience under their belt. Coming from such different backgrounds, rivalry was inevitable. They were all one big happy family, but actually we, we would like to get one over them. And we always thought APT has been just a buffins experiment. The in-house engineers launch a bold bid to make their own rival train based on tried and tested technology. They said, let's develop you know, a train that isn't tilting, but goes fast, is, is very uh, powerful, can go maybe up to 125 miles an hour, We'll call it HST, High Speed Train, or 125, as it uh, soon became known as. Um, and they said, we can develop this in a couple of years. The board decided they really needed something else to get us across the divide, and it was going to be a stopgap. It turned out to be an extremely good stopgap because it outlived anything else that was been designed before or since. The engineers get to work on their stopgap solution producing a viable prototype high-speed train, or HST, within just two years. In the department were several people who had experience of other trains, so they knew a lot about the troubles various bits of equipment are likely to give. And when they heard what the APT were thinking about, they said, well, this is the way to go forward. Let's use conventional bits. The engineers must overcome a crucial problem. No existing diesel engine can run a service over 100 miles an hour. Legend has it that an apprentice piped up with a revolutionary idea, use two engines, one at either end of the train, to boost its speed. A high-speed train together, with which coaches in between, has two power cars each end. So it's got the driver at the front of it, you know, and his second man, a room for the guard at the back. That's a power car. It's an entirely self-contained unit that can power itself up and down the tracks. Two power cars increases the potential for speed, but existing locos can only manage 100 miles an hour. And BR had the ambition to go much faster, 125 miles an hour. To do that, they needed more power, but the problem was you couldn't just put bigger engines into uh, locos uh, and expect them to travel faster because of the weight. 
If British Rail is to survive, they need something faster. The engineers have got to find a lightweight engine with more power. They turned to the Navy, who used Paxman engines that fitted the bill. The Ark Royal, the, the Admiral Entry engines, they were never the main, main propulsion. They were always auxiliary supplies. I believe they had eight Valentia engines in that Ark Royal. 79 litres uh, engine, to, so to put it in perspective, 79 times the size of your average family car. The Paxman Valenta engine has a turbocharger which gives the 125 its distinctive howl. Some of the enthusiasts can tell you two miles away what loco's coming because of the noise that the, that the engine's making, but the HST certainly had their own unique sound. The 125 team have their new engine, but they now face yet another major problem, one that could derail the whole project. Nineteen seventy two. British Rail's team of in house engineers now have a high speed train that can travel at one hundred and twenty five miles an hour. But they still have a major problem how to stop it. If you speed a train up, you've got to assume that it has to slow down as well. And of course, if you speed it up, it takes a longer time to slow down. The new high speed trains travelling at one hundred and twenty five miles an hour have to stop in the same distance as older trains travelling at 100 miles an hour. And the traditional braking system isn't up to the job. Moving every signal to allow for longer stopping distances would bankrupt British Rail. Could the wizardry of new electronics be the answer? I was a, a very young engineer at the time, moved from the defence electronics industry into the railway industry to look at the application of electronics to train control systems, which was something in those days was very, very new. Ron is among a small group of electronics specialists invited to Derby by the 125 engineering team. Electronics, of course, was black magic to a lot of people in the traditional railway industry because electronics were, were unknown, the reliability was perhaps not appreciated. And I remember, as a very junior engineer, being invited to make a presentation, and I could see people taking three paces to the rear of the room and looking in shock and horror at the thought of using electronics to control the brake system. It seems that Ron's pioneering theories might never see the light of day. Luckily, the chief mechanical engineer sees some promise in them. He stood up and said, I think we should try it, give him a chance. And that was it. We went away and developed an electronically controlled system. Ron's electronic system cut some 600 yards off the traditional stopping distance, the length of six football pitches. This means they don't have to move the signals, saving British Rail from financial disaster. Today at the Neville Hill Depot in Leeds, these ageing beasts arrive for routine maintenance on their brakes. Each train has 160 brake pads. Andy has to check every single one. They've got to be changed every uh, two or three weeks, depending on how quickly they wear. And uh, when they get to the, about that thickness, uh, they need to be taken out and changed for a new one. You can see the difference uh, in thickness. So I was born the year the prototype came out, 1976. It's uh, a long time. It's still a solid train. The frames and the chassis are still solid and they can go on for another 20 years if they needed to. But mucking out these workhorses can be a nasty job. Ever wonder why the signs say, don't flush the toilet while the train is in the station? It's because the 125 has no sewage tanks. The toilets empty straight onto the tracks. Companies say it's too costly to retrofit tanks on trains that might soon be replaced. So luckily for Andy, emptying the loo is one job they don't need to do here. But there's plenty more going on behind the scenes. Heather's part of the operation is keeping these veterans running for East Midlands. 
So whether it's just a quick windscreen change or a massive engine overhaul, there is a lot of work goes on on a daily basis here. Operating 89 stations and around 1,000 miles of track, this is a 24-hour, seven days a week operation, ensuring these 125s are back carrying passengers as quickly as possible. They see them coming to the station, they get on, they travel on them. All of this, I don't think they have a clue happens. Back in 1972, the engineers have met their brief in record time, coming up with a new train that would keep costs down, improve speed and stop in the right distance. But to be the finished package, the train needs a modern makeover, 1970s style. They call on one of Britain's new breed of industrial designers. Kenneth Grange, the man behind iconic designs from the Kenwood Chef and the parking meter to the angle poise lamp is brought in to tackle the largest product he's ever worked on. On one hand, I could easily count the people who were practicing product design. So it's not surprising that you'd get a toothbrush to do in the morning and a train in the afternoon. Kenneth Grange was a modernist. He is naturally enthused and intrigued by objects and wants them to be as fun and as joyous as they can be. Whenever I got a product to design, they happily let me do all the packaging that went with it. Sometimes a bit of advertising. So you, you dabble and you play and so on. Grange is commissioned to design a new paint job for the train. They came to me and said, uh, look, this is what they're planning to do, and gave me a model of a rather crude looking train, but we need to decorate it. He didn't think much of the existing design. When he initially saw the very boxy design that British Rail had come up with, I think he felt that this could be better. It really was rather quite brutal, rather clumsy. I thought, oh, I'd like to get my hands on that. Although the brief was nothing to do with the shape, absolutely not at all. Without consulting British Rail, Grange takes it upon himself to redesign the entire shape of the front of the train to make it more streamlined. We used to make a model and then go down to Imperial College and give the bloke a fiver and he'd wind up the wind tunnel and we'd produce some photographs of a shape. Because there was no other basis on which to design as far as I was concerned. He made some models that he felt would not only improve the design, but improve the speed of the train. Grange comes up with a much more aerodynamic nose cone. The air goes around the size of the train, leading to faster speeds and sleeker design. Knowing he has gone well beyond the given brief, he takes his radical new design to the board. Serious players aboard of directors of the railways, um, uh, they were expecting at this meeting to see a, a smart new paintwork on this model. And I pulled out these pictures of the wind tunnel, the smoke trails and things. And to their everlasting credit, they said, oh, that seems even better. So that they got both. And I was up and away. Grange's draft design is given the green light, but the timing is terrible. British society is suffering from a serious hooligan problem. Hooliganism wasn't invented yesterday. There's always been bad behaviour in this country. There is an underlying uh, violence in the uh, British character. Ever since there have been railways, there have been um, what I must politely describe as village idiots. There'd been quite a few incidents where small boys would hang a house brick over the edge of a bridge and enjoy seeing a train smash into it. Well, that wasn't good for the driver, that's sure. On your marks, get set. The problem was so serious, this public information film conjured up a terrifying fantasy world where school sports day took place on the local railway line. It was pretty strong stuff. Broken window, two points. Direct hit on driver, six points. 
Total for yellow, uh. eight points. But it wasn't just a fantasy. There had been incidents of driver fatalities from front windows being smashed with bricks. This new train was going to address that, and it was going to have armour-plated glass. To protect the driver, British Rail turns to specialist glass manufacturer Pilkington. Pilkington were the leading edge in world development of glass. And if you're designing windows for aircraft, then you're the people you're going to go to when it comes to the need for a, a, an armour-plated window on a train. This famous British company was making the windscreens for Concord. They supply the 125 with the same high-strength glass. Now to make the interior of his train as light as possible, Grange looks to the latest technological advances in space travel. NASA had been developing a particular knitted fabric that they were using for aeronauts' chairs and therefore were massively lightweight. And so we made a prototype and it really looked to be well on the way and quite radical, but very unhappily, it coincided with a fashion among football fans to carry Stanley knives. At that point, football fans tended to go around the country by train. And if they were vicious enough and nasty enough and vile enough, they planned their, their little um, outings. And trains were being wrecked because these guys would just rip the seats apart. Now, you couldn't conceivably go into the marketplace with a net chair. Once again, the great British hooligan has done a number on the design of the 125. Grange is forced to come up with an alternative made of stronger material. He designs an upholstered chair with moulded armrests, setting the style for train seats today. Grange's groundbreaking new train design now appears to be finished, and this fully functioning prototype is built, ready for testing. Before any finished passenger trains can go into production, the prototype has to undergo a series of rigorous tests. At the time, none of us knew whether the whole project would go forward. And having got a prototype, would it ever get to a production build? But hundreds, thousands of, of, of new bits and pieces in the train, and all these had to be designed and proven, tested. It was a big gamble, a big gamble. If the project is to succeed, the prototype train must hit speeds well above any existing diesel locomotive. On June the 12th, 1973, the 125 prototype was on the test track. On the high speed run, I recollect being sat on the floor by the door of the toilet with a, a measuring device to measure the airflow. Not very glamorous. The train was coming 130-something before we knew what we were doing. And air is whizzing past, and also a lot of air is coming through, so if you've got any loose clothing, you'd be uh, looking to keep it on. The prototype 125 sets a world diesel speed record of 143.2 miles an hour. It felt very fast because I'd not experienced more than 100 miles an hour before. I don't think many people in the UK had. We were happily doing 130 without difficulty and, and finally 143. When the national press got hold of the fact we'd got uh, a, a new speed record, we got not only had we got the speed record for the UK, but we were now the fastest diesel train in the world. And you may have noticed that those on board were presented with a commemorative tie, which says HST 143. But I can say I got the tie. Justifiably. We bought a copy of every national paper and to see what it said about our train. And what stuck in my mind ever since is what the Yorkshire Post said. The dark day is not over. The slump in morale as the great network of routes dwindled has been dispersed by the high speed blast of a new railway era.
Amazingly, the original prototype is still around today. It's been lovingly restored by the 125 Group on a 10-mile heritage line near Nottingham. It still works, but not quite at the speed of its heyday. This is the last remaining prototype, and it really is a national treasure. And uh, I can assure you we look after it very well. This actual prototype power car, it broke the world speed record for diesel rail traction back in 1973, doing 143 miles an hour, which was a hell of a speed in those days. It's every uh, boy's dream, isn't it, to be a train driver? Who wouldn't want to be in charge of a 125-mile-an-hour uh, high-speed train? Encouraged by this success, British Rail is keen to get their dual-engine train into action in hope of persuading passengers back onto their railway. The first prototype went out, set a new world record, everybody happy as Larry. Um, and then there was a change, the management and the unions decided between them that um, they'd need two people. The prototype has been built for a single driver, but the unions are insisting that a train travelling over 100 miles an hour needs two drivers and so requires a larger windscreen for them to see out of. The train drivers' union stuck its heels in over the design of the prototype app. And there was good reason for that. There are occasions where you do need two drivers in charge of a train. So they both need chairs to sit on, they both need a good view through the windscreen. So really, the prototype 125, it, it didn't fit the bill. With the unions refusing to budge, it looks like Grange will have to redesign the cab completely to accommodate two drivers. It meant that the original design that Kenneth came up with, which was a quite small window, would need to be expanded. And he was worried then about losing the gains that he'd made through the aerodynamics. A larger piece of glass across the cab would interrupt the shape of Grange's design, creating harsh corners at the edges and increasing wind resistance. So there was a bit of an impasse there. We, we really stuck, don't know what to do. The obstacles keep coming, and the future of rail travel in Britain is hanging by a thread. Does this spell the end for British Rail? <laughs> 17th of June, 1973. The prototype of the new Intercity 125 high-speed train has broken the world's speed record for diesel. But before it can go into production, it's hit a serious problem. The unions are insisting that a train travelling over 100 miles an hour needs two drivers, and so requires a larger windscreen to see out of. Designer Kenneth Grange is struggling to keep his design aerodynamic. Before going back to the drawing board, he consults British Rail's chief engineer in Derby. I said, look, let's just go back over the whole the whole rigmarole of this geometry. I said, and the buffers? And he said, well, actually, on this train, we don't need buffers. Traditional trains need buffers to couple together and shunt their carriages. But because the 125's power cars would be permanently connected to its carriages, they would never need to shunt anything. And so, in fact, don't need buffers. This is the key, the key, key change of the whole thing. This shape here um, could be nominally that shape there. Removing the buffers frees Grange to give the nose cone a much sharper design. He angles the larger windscreen to create more space for two drivers and gives the train a sleek, aerodynamic shape. The 125's iconic profile is born. That particular piece of, like, the geometry of the train has given it its visual personality. So it's a peculiar set of happy accidents.
it looked terrific. It had this new uh, front end, the, the wedge-shaped front, which is the iconic symbol of Intercity, I guess even today, uh, 40 years on, and we owe him a big thanks for creating something great. Grange's distinctive yellow and blue paint job makes the new train instantly recognisable. It's blue, grey and yellow, which is absolutely brilliant. It looks like the thing's actually moving, even when it's sitting still, and that's why it's so great. It's got this high-energy, high-visual yellow front to it. Back in the day, you'd get trains which had mixed carriages. They weren't all matched, they weren't all painted the same. It basically looked a bit of a mess. Suddenly, you've got a train that was designed to be a train, an entity. The radical design didn't stop with the exterior. Inside the train, the passenger experience has been reinvented. New Mark III carriages feature modern interiors with automatic doors between open-plan carriages, double glazing and air conditioning. But the inside, they were warm, the air conditioning. I mean, who'd ever even heard of air conditioning before? The 125 had kind of brought back up again the idea of style and a bit of, you know, a bit of high-speed elegance to the railway network. There's no doubt that the 125 was revolutionary in terms of train travel. Just compare the idea of being pulled along by a smelly old locomotive or even a, a, a diesel train belching kind of smoke compared to the smooth running of the 125 with its kind of nose cone that looked kind of sleek. What was there not to like? The first Intercity 125 leaves Paddington Station on the 4th of October 1976, bound for Bristol. Those who try it, love it. My first journey on a, a 125 was out of Paddington, and I was immediately impressed when I walked on the train. It, it, it looked modern, and I felt for the first time I was part of a modern railway. It was definitely modern. Instead of being a sort of rattling, door-clanging, uncomfortable cattle truck, it was a luxurious thing where you sat down and you saw the world go by. British Rail has finally got a world-beating, high-speed train that could save it from impending disaster. Surprisingly, though, it isn't champagne all round. I can't remember any fanfares or this, that and the other. They just went into service. It was just let in quite slowly. It wasn't expected to be a success. It wasn't required to be a huge success. It was there as a stopgap solution. 27 new trains are ordered to run on the relatively straight Great Western route, where their top speed can really slash journey times. But British Rail actually needs around 100 new high-speed trains to cover its entire network. Despite everything, it's still pinning its hopes on the APT, the tilting train that's waiting in the wings. The 125 was supposed to be just a stopgap. There would be this revolutionary train, the APT, the advanced passenger train, which would take over because of its tilting capability, able to run faster than the HST. I don't think there's any doubt the APT was a, a finer train. It was a more refined train than the 125s. Coming up next time, the 125 is put front and centre of a bold new ad campaign. And who's ever heard of a train jam? This train might actually be the saviour of British Rail. Super Chef Prue Leith takes on British Rail's image problem. So he said that they are Britain's most popular sandwich. And I said, well, of course they are. They're <laughs> the only sandwich you can buy. And disaster strikes the 125. The yellow freight tray was virtually cut in two by the Intercity 125. How will this underdog stopgap train ever make its mark?
Well, if there's anyone with a passion for trains, it's Rob Bell, and he's uncovering a whole network of hidden wonders tonight. Join him walking Britain's Lost Railways new at nine. Next, Intercity 125 continues. For over 40 years, the Intercity 125, Britain's first high-speed train, has been the workhorse of the railways. Frankly, it was the train that saved British railways. Saved them from a fate worse than death, maybe. That's where the railways turned the corner and started to become an acceptable modern way of transport. A triumph of British design. You know, even today, when I see one, I'm pleased to be getting on that train. I think it's a beautiful machine. It had this new front end, the, the wedge-shaped front, which is the iconic symbol of Intercity, I guess, even today. It's got that sleek look with the lines. It makes you think of efficiency. We've all travelled on one, but now the 125s are slowly being replaced by new electric trains from Japan. The 125 will be sorely missed. Oh, I love them. When you're driving it, you really feel like you're driving a train. You're not sort of sat in some playing a video game or something. You can feel the power they've got. This is the story of the Intercity 125. Single-handedly, it would revolutionise train travel, revitalise British Rail's image, and in time establish itself as a true icon of the railway age. Back in the 1970s, clever marketing showcased the virtues of travelling by high-speed train. We were brave enough to start having advertising slogans like, this is the age of the train. This is the age. Even the British Rail sandwich got a makeover. I had got it into my head that I would do something about the sandwiches, and they were wrapped up in the clinker, and they were soggy, and they were tasteless. But before we get to the age of the train and the end of the soggy sarnie, we need to get back to the mid-70s when the 125 was launched. When 125 was introduced, it was envisaged as a stopgap. There would be this revolutionary train, the advanced passenger train, which would take over. The bet on two different horses, a classic British compromise. Today, nearly 100 of these intercity 125s are still in frontline service, and they're still the fastest diesel trains in the world. Back in 1976, the stakes for British Rail couldn't be higher. They have a dual-engine diesel train in the shape of the 125, but BR bosses foresee a very different future, one where tilting electric trains rule the rails. The whole point of this brand new advanced passenger train was that it was supposed to be able to pick up speed, and in order to pick up speed, it was going to tilt to go round corners. This ability to tilt into the bends allows the advanced passenger train, known as the APT, to travel at up to 155 miles per hour on Britain's twisting network. It became very obvious around about 1970 that the board was backing two horses, the advanced passenger train, which was full of new technology, and the high-speed train, which was a more orthodox train with traditional technology, which could be built faster, but which would only be diesel. So we had both horses running at that time. British Rail now has two rivals for the high-speed crown, the diesel 125 and the electric APT. In the mid-70s, the Intercity 125 is running on only one route, the relatively straight railway line from Paddington to Bristol and South Wales, and it's proving popular. So you've got, for example, on the London-Bristol route, uh, a 33% increase in travellers over the first two years after it was introduced. Despite this success, British Rail is still hoping that the bendier routes of the West and East Coast main lines to Edinburgh, Manchester and Liverpool will be served by a fleet of tilting trains. The original prototype of the APT. Kit Spackman, known as Mr Tilt, was a lead engineer on the project back in the 70s. 
He played a crucial role in designing the train's hydraulic tilting system. Everything about it was completely brand new. It had to tilt to go around the corners 50% faster. It had to stop faster as well, which meant new braking technology. Of course, the fundamental thing was the fact that the darn thing had to be stable on the track. This prototype hasn't moved in 30 years, and Kit is keen to see if its revolutionary hydraulics still work. Ready again, Brian? Yep. OK! It's good to see it tilting again after all this time. Technical problems with the APT are slowly being ironed out, and by the mid-70s, Kit Spackman and his team are starting to believe that their tilting train can become the fastest passenger train that Britain has ever seen. St Pancras to Leicester runs were absolutely the single most important test that we ever did. It proved beyond doubt that the concept worked. The route from London to Leicester is one of the twistiest in the country. By tilting around the corners, the APT can travel 40% faster than conventional trains. All right. And it tests, reaches 162 miles an hour. Excellent. Nice to see it going after all this time. The awesome feature there was going around those curves so fast. So curves that I was used to going around at at 80 miles an hour, we were suddenly going around at 125 miles an hour and the coach was making significant tilts to the left and right, rather like being on a motorcycle. British Rail is so impressed with its performance, they asked Blue Peter presenter Peter Purvis to make a promotional film about the APT. I can remember driving the advanced passenger train, and it was so smooth, it felt, as we pulled out, as it, like the whole thing was moving as one. And we were only going from Euston Station to Brent Sidings, but we still got up to 100 miles an hour, which, which was very exciting. For BR, the future still belongs to their tilting train. But after nearly 10 years in development, it's still nowhere near ready to carry passengers. APT was a very good train. It, it uh, produced a lot of information about what you could do with wheels and rails and how fast you could go around curves, tilting. But to develop a fleet of trains that could carry passengers was going to take a long time. In business, time is money, so British Rail is forced to fall back on the tried and tested 125. More are ordered to plug the gap while tests continue on the APT. But BR know it'll take more than shiny new trains to win over the travelling public. And round about that time, we were brave enough to start having advertising slogans like, this is the age of the train. This is the age of the train was a darn good idea. Everybody said, yeah, dead right, it's the age of the train. The damn thing's 40 years old. Its fate rests on an ambitious ad campaign. This is the age. Can it sell the 125 to a sceptical public? By 1977, British Rail's fate hangs in the balance. They're gambling that an advertising campaign will help secure the future of Britain's railways. It's a tall order. The railways are well known for their poor customer service and delays. British Rail was an absolute nightmare. And it was famous for being that way. It was dirty, it was ramshackle. And, you know, were you going to get there on time? I think in those days, if you had to go on a train, it was a penance, and you went and you paid through the nose. If you could avoid a train, if you could go under your own steam, you did so. The surly staff, trains not running on time, everything sort of dirty, the carriages not being swept or cleaned. Who would want to travel on the kind of trains that we had then? And so people didn't. It needed a big kick. That kick comes in the shape of ad agency Alan Brady and Marsh. The research that we undertook threw up, I think, one fundamental um, insight. And that was 
trains were loved, but British Rail wasn't. If ABM is going to secure the biggest advertising account in Britain, they'll have to deliver this difficult news to British Rail's top executives. This task falls to the agency's flamboyant chief executive, Peter Marsh. Peter Marsh as a character was an ex-actor. He was an ex-director, he was an ex-theatre producer. He, he was acting personified. He saw um, advertising as, as theatre. To win over the British Rail bosses, Peter Marsh plans a stunt that sounds like it was straight out of the TV series Mad Men. So they came in and we kept them waiting. The receptionist was sort of filing her nails and didn't really care that they came in. There were an ashtray sort of overflowing with dog ends, as they were then known as, bits of paper on the floor and so on and so forth. And they haven't at this stage seen Peter Marsh or Rod Allen. They brought Peter Parker, the chair of the British Rail at the time, up to the London office and they made him sit there, I think, for 15 minutes and made him wait for their pitch. He getting increasingly furious in reception. And then Peter and Rod appear dressed as railway employees. What Peter said to them was, you have just experienced what everybody else experiences of British Rail. That's their experience. That's what they've told us. Now we're going to tell you how you can transform that expectation of British Rail. That transformation involves placing the Intercity 125 at the heart of the campaign. BR know these adverts have to work. You might just remember this one. The musical jingle came about from Rod. Rod Allen wrote all the jingles. He had a piano in his office and he would literally just bang out the jingles. And he just had a natural talent. The Age of the Train campaign soon embeds itself in the national consciousness. They started to get behind it because they realised that British Rail actually hang its, its coat on this. This train might actually be the saviour of British Rail. This is the to complete the campaign, they need a frontman, someone seen as trustworthy and with universal appeal. We looked at a lot of different people, and the person who came out tops, by a long way, when you started looking at all those different criteria, was Jimmy Savile. So why not do what I do, take the train? I think a lot of them were done by the appalling Jimmy Savile of unfond memory. Despite what we know today of Savile's monstrous acts, back then, he's a popular figure, and the ads are a hit. They sell the 125 experience as something futuristic and aspirational. You know, the tables were there, it, there was plenty of light, it was clean, it was... The ride was relatively smooth, there were comfortable seats to sit in, you had room to work, you had time to work, you had the quiet to work. It wasn't noisy like the old trains had been. Tempting people back to the railways was never going to be easy. The bad old days of British Rail has created a nation of car lovers. When I started work uh, uh, as a reporter, um, I turned away from rail as, as soon as I possibly could. And it was actually more convenient to drive than to go by train. Train was not an option that you would choose, so we, we drove literally everywhere. If the advertisements had been directed by Alfred Hitchcock, they wouldn't have made me travel on a 125 train. I didn't want to go on uh, uh, the railways in this country if I could possibly avoid it. It's exactly this kind of attitude that the adverts go on to target. There's a lovely uh, advert they did. It's called Train Jam. And in this advert, Train Jam, they say, you know, uh, you wouldn't have to stop off at services. You wouldn't have to change the, car, the, the, the wheels on your car. When was the last time you made a long business trip and your train had to stop for breakfast, stop for you to do some work, or stop to spend a penny? 
When did you last see a train with a puncture? Jacking up a train to speed find the, the policeman overtakes a, a 125 in a, in a class 37 with a uh, <laughs> it's siren blaring. It's a brilliant advert. Or a train get nicked for speeding. And who's ever heard of a train jam? It was there to prove, actually, that the 125 was the thing that was going to take people back off the roads onto the railways, and it did that. The ad is perfectly timed. Traffic jams are becoming a familiar feature of Britain's roads. As a result, more car owners are being tempted back to the railways, thanks to the 125. However, there's one area where BR is still seen as a joke. Cheese sandwich, anyone? I have eaten the Great British Rail Sandwich on numerous occasions, or I've half eaten some of them. Curly British Rail Sandwich was uh, quite notorious back then. You'd have had sandwiches which would have been cheese sandwich or ham sandwich or something very, very plain. So someone at BR cooked up the idea of asking Chef Prue Leith to join the board. I knew Peter Parker, who was the chairman of British Rail, because my husband played tennis with him. And he knew my businesses, and he needed a woman who had a business and who um, he th thought was strong enough to be the only woman on a mail board. Prue is used to calling the shots. Now she finds herself at the heart of a massive nationalised industry. For the first three board meetings that I sat through, I never heard the word passenger or customer once. Prue is determined to change this attitude. I had got it into my head that I would do something about the sandwiches. The BR sandwich seems to embody everything that's wrong with British Rail. The press used to say that I'd been hired to uncurl the British Rail sandwich, which was kind of funny, but, I mean, they were never curly, the British Rail sandwiches, because they weren't on a tray getting curly from drying out. They were wrapped up in horrible cling film and they were soggy as anything. First, she has to persuade the catering boss that change is needed. So he said, but they're most, they are Britain's most popular sandwich. And I said, well, of course they are. <laughs> they're the only sandwich you can buy. And um, he said, no, 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 it's because we use Britain's most popular bread, which is Mother's Pride, Britain's most popular butter, which is Anchor Butter, and Britain's most popular cheese, which is Kraft Cheese Slices. <laughs> so, of course, it's the most popular sandwich. Prue isn't convinced. So she carries out her own market research. I finally did a test on Paddington Station and I made lots of other, you know, other kinds of sandwiches. I remember the sardine sandwiches, salami one and prawn one, I think. Various different sandwiches and with different breads and also one of those cheese sandwiches. Nearly 40 years after Prue's taste test, We've come back to Paddington Station to see if today's commuters can guess what was BR's most popular sandwich back in the 70s. I'd say the, um, the um, egg and bacon sandwiches. Uh, cheese and tomato, I think. I would have said cheese. I suspect the only sandwich was cheese sandwich on white bread, and I think they were stale before they were even ever got the train. And we went around um, offering them free to the customers and just watching which line disappeared. And it wasn't the cheese <laughs> sandwich. In the 70s, the most popular sandwich from a very limited range was the cheese sarni. Is it still a hit today? Very unappealing. Uh, the cheese looks like processed cheese. This is the sort of sandwich I wouldn't have eaten. <laughs> <laughs> sort of plasticky looking cheese rather than real cheese. Could it be yesterday's second week? You're not going to make me eat it, are you? I'll taste it, yeah. This is really horrible. <laughs> it's bad news for BR's most popular option. So what about Prue's more adventurous sandwich selection with its cheese plowmans and smoked salmon on wholemeal bread? We put our sandwiches into decent boxes. The first glance is what sells something. And if the filling looks good, you will sell it. These look more appealing than those. If a sandwich is wrapped up in cling film, you can't even see the filling because the cling film sort of pours the bread over the, over the filling. 
Cling film trapped the moisture, making the bread soggy. Prue's boxes let the air circulate. No more soggy sarnies. So I won my case, and we got, um, got better sandwiches. The whole experience of eating on board the 125 is greatly improved thanks to bigger buffet cars and new technology. Before you got these trains, you were given the choice of cheese or ham, and that, that, was, that was pretty well it. Once you got these on board, then the, the range just widened significantly. Every 125 is fitted out with fridges and state-of-the-art microwave ovens. British Rail has never had it so good. Its stopgap train has become a huge success. And thanks to clever marketing and better sandwiches, BR's reputation is revitalised. But change is in the air. Somebody who, for dogmatic political reasons, never went on the train was Mrs Thatcher. When I first joined the British Railways Board, it was in a fine old panic because Mrs Thatcher had just come to power. She hated trains. She was quite open about it. She also had this idea that the answer to Britain's transport problems was really to concrete over the railways, make more motorways, let every man in the country own a motor car and just forget about the railways. The threat is real. No longer are the railways the quickest and easiest way from A to B. BR were coming under increasing competition from the internal airlines. Um, it was becoming more and more feasible to travel uh, by air rather than by train. The Intercity 125 is turning a profit, but British Rail is losing money hand over fist. Added to this is the spiralling cost of the advanced passenger train, which is still stuck at the prototype stage. One of the oddities of the Thatcher period was that she privatised gas, she privatised electricity, she privatised water, but she left the trains alone. Mrs Thatcher did not dare take on what was seen as quite a popular British rail and certainly a very popular intercity service with its 125s. So one could say that the 125s staved off privatisation for a few years. The success of the 125 means British Rail is safe for now, at least. However, questions are being asked about the costly APT. If it's to rival the 125, it needs to emerge from the shadows and show the public what it can do. The advanced passenger train was totally different. This was a new cutting-edge technology. I was very, very impressed with what they'd done with it, and uh, the ride was absolutely magnificent. Here comes the APT. Wow, how good is that? Would the tilting train mark the end of the 125 before it had even really got started? The Intercity 125 is setting new standards in speed and passenger comfort. Back in 1981, it's make or break time for the tilting advance passenger train. If it's to survive, the public has to see why it deserves to replace the 125. We saw our future on rail as the advanced passenger train. We just had to beat the airlines. The airlines were about an hour to London. Uh, we were about five hours. So the advanced passenger train was a big hope. British Rail's research tells them that if the APT can break the psychological four-hour barrier from Glasgow to London, more customers will choose trains over planes. I remember standing on the platform at Glasgow Central as it arrived from London in three hours, 52 minutes. And we really thought this was the future. We thought we cracked it. Practice runs are one thing. The real test comes when fare-paying passengers climb on board. After 10 years in development, the launch of the advanced passenger train is finally set for December 1981. People were thrilled to be going on it. Come and see this wonderful thing. British Rail is racing to get their new train ready in what is one of the coldest winter months on record. 
And in Glasgow, there were two engineers working on the whole train to get it ready for this final inaugural run, or what it was supposed to be. And they were absolutely shattered in Glasgow. They were wrecked. The first passenger run from Glasgow to London goes without a hitch. Two days later, on the 9th of December, 1981, it's the turn of the TV news. There was that fateful morning where there was that terrible early trip where journalists were taken down from Glasgow down to London. Do you think you're going to make it to London today? Oh, of course we are. Seasoned news correspondent Michael Cole is in Glasgow with a film crew, boarding the advanced passenger train bound for London as the worst snowstorm in a century approaches. It was a fiercely cold morning and Glasgow Central Station was almost deserted. There were very few people going on the advanced passenger train. A couple of uh, newsmen, uh, another film crew and myself. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You are travelling on the Intercity AET from Glasgow to London, Houston. The train is now ready to depart. Will the passengers please stand clear of the doors? It's 7 a.m. and still dark. The APT is the first train of the day to run on the freezing track. It more or less left on time, but as soon as it was out of the station, you were aware that there was a problem because the lights in the brand new carriages were flashing on and off. But after only eight minutes, the lights flickered and dimmed and APT coasted to a shameful halt. Ice on the overhead power cables is interrupting the power supply. The advanced passenger train had had a difficult first run, then it had one or two runs that were OK, but this one looked the worst of them all. And I thought to myself, even then, no commercial organisation would choose to try out its new baby, its new invention, its new vehicle in the middle of winter in adverse weather conditions. Electrical faults are only the beginning of the tilting train's problem. The ride was absolutely magnificent until it started to get light. And um, some distance further down where you could see where you were going and see outside and going around a bend, you could see the horizon going up and down at the same time. Certain members of the media were um, became a little unwell, shall we say. You could feel the, the carriage swing one way and then, then another. The coffee stays level, but the coaches tilt inwards on the curves by as much as nine degrees. It was a big risk uh, taking journalists on this trial train so early because the journalists then complained about the tilt, they complained about their tea being spilt. It isn't just spilt tea. Some of the journalists on board describe feeling sick as the train tilts around the bends. It might have to do with the fact that people drinking the night before, being taken out as part of the corporate, you know, press sort of style of the time. I mean, it was a slight motion. If ever you've been to Disneyland, this is nothing for you. I mean, it, it, uh, it was hardly noticeable. I think they must be absolute wimps. Wimps or not, the journalist complaints unnerved the APT's designers who launched an investigation. It was determined that um, what became known as tilt sickness was very analogous to car sickness, to sea sickness and to air sickness. What you can feel, or in this case what you can't feel, with the balance canals in your ears doesn't stack up with what you can see out of the window. Um, you feel as if you're perfectly level and the horizon's going up and down like a yo-yo. While some people are prone to that, some people aren't. There are more technical problems when, 150 miles from London, it grinds to a halt. Now, I thought, well, this is just British Rail being its usual incompetent self, but I suddenly realised this is a story. It's now 11.15, the time we were due to arrive at Euston, but here we are at Crewe, 158 miles from London, and we've been told that because of adverse weather conditions down the line, the advanced passenger train will be terminating its journey right here. Not that we knew it at the time, that was the last commercial proper run ever for the advanced passenger train. I think the press wanted there to be something wrong with it. I don't know why. Seems crazy. Why couldn't they just praise this wonderful piece of technology? 
After the disastrous press launch, another problem is discovered. The fear was that if two trains met each other, one with a tilted coach that hadn't straightened up that way, and one with a tilted coach that hadn't come up that way, that they meet on three corners, just three bends on the whole network that it was to travel on, they would collide. It turns out the train designed to tilt around bends can't tilt around all of them without risking disaster. It's the final nail in the coffin of the APT. After a decade in development and at a cost of 47 million pounds, the tilting train project is cancelled. It was a colossal failure. We mustn't, we mustn't hide the fact of how big a failure this was. It was taken and hidden. It, they were that embarrassed. The APT was a, a project that was ahead of its time. Um, it, was, it was pushing people and technology to absolute limit. Now then, Jock, how does this work? It's really sad for me that it didn't work. It was a beautiful train. Advanced passenger train died of shame. Perhaps the advanced passenger train was just too advanced for its own good. By contrast, the 125's much simpler design, with a power car at each end, pushing and pulling the carriages, saw it enter service a full five years before the APT was finished. BR had bet on two horses. By the mid-80s, only one is still running. The survival of Britain's railways rests on the success of the 125. It was exactly the right technology and it worked. It was exactly the right product and it increased its passengers by a third in two years. The 125 enabled more people to travel much faster over longer distances, including commuters. Despite the twisting tracks at the west coast and the north, the 125 is still able to cut journey times. Newcastle is now three hours from London, Manchester a little over two and a half. The 125 has not just changed the railway, but um, good communications uh, and fast rail links change the, the social makeup of, of the country. As you can see, I'm travelling along in the utmost style and comfort and at 125 miles per hour. It became possible to have a meeting in the morning in Leeds and have a meeting in the afternoon in London or in Sheffield or in Edinburgh or in Bristol. You know, you could move around between the cities in a much, much more comfortable and quicker way. Up-to-date people in Britain travel by train. We went not just for speed in Britain, but we went for frequency. These are the everyday trains of Britain. And if you miss one, there's another right behind. They were part of making us more British and less regional. The railways of Britain spread out across the countryside, drawing communities closer to each other. Its speed is also opening up new opportunities for the commuter. It's swift, it's smart, it's smooth, it's prompt, and it's nationwide. In the 1980s, Keith Roberts was working as a manager on the London Underground. With a young family, he was keen to escape to the countryside. Peterborough was just that bit too far because of the train service and uh, it was slow and uh, sometimes unreliable. The 125 arrived and suddenly I could leave centre of London and get home to Peterborough before some of my work colleagues could on the London Underground. It's not just about the journey time. The 125 offers unprecedented levels of comfort. It, it rode comfortably, uh, it was air-conditioned, and it was a comfortable journey, and that was important. You didn't want to end up in London tired because you were commuting. This ability to commute greater distances sparks a boom in house building. Remember when a new house cost just £14 a week? No, me neither. Quite remarkably, somewhere you would see as a, a country road with a few fields would suddenly turn into a housing estate. A new generation of commuter trains springs up along the route of the 125. Peterborough is joined by Milton Keynes, Swindon and Reading as the commuter belt grows. 
By 1986, passenger numbers between London and Bristol have increased by an incredible 20%. The age of the commuter has arrived. I think it had quite a big, quiet, but quite a big economic impact, actually, and a feeling that we were all part of one thing. Thanks to the 125, an army of commuters is now driving Britain's burgeoning economy. Then, in September 1997, that success is called into question in the most tragic of circumstances. It happened at lunchtime when an intercity express travelling from Swansea to Paddington collided with a goods train at Southall. The yellow freight train was virtually cut in two by the intercity 125. The Southall crash killed seven people and injured 139. Two years later, in October 1999, another 125 is at the centre of what remains one of Britain's worst rail accidents. Two trains, at least 500 passengers. Then, at 11 minutes past eight this morning, the crash. The crash at Ladbroke Grove leaves 31 people dead and 523 injured. If the fundamental design of this train is found to be at fault, it could spell the end for the 125. One aspect of the train we all take for granted nowadays is its sheer strength. And that Mark III coach in the 1970s was really built to withhold accidents and keep you safe in a capsule inside the train. These Mark III coaches, which are still in use today, are linked by what are called vestibules, self-contained areas next to the train doors. It looks like it had large vestibules for movement as well, and effectively crash zones and crumple zones between the vestibules. You've got to have a complete safe train built for that kind of speed. The Mark III coaches had successfully absorbed much of the impact. Their external steel skin supports the entire structure, making it exceptionally strong. An inquiry attaches no blame to the design of the 125. Both crashes are the result of trains passing red stop signals. Whilst there were deaths and injuries, sadly, they would have been massively worse than the older style trains. These are tough trains. The Intercity 125 has an excellent safety record. Today, it has a new role. You can't buy a ticket for this 125, but it's the key to keeping rail passengers safe. We have come across a problem. The intercity 125 trains are tough old workhorses. They put in over four decades of service, but now they're being replaced by new trains from Japan. Over the next few years, 122 of these high-tech trains built by Hitachi will come into service. All will be electric, and almost half will be able to switch between running on overhead wires or where a line has not been electrified as diesels. The diesel 125 is slowly disappearing from service, but there's one train that's escaped the cull. Meet the Flying Banana. It's the nickname for Network Rail's new measurement train. This modified 125 is the most technologically advanced train of its kind anywhere in the world. The 125 was chosen to perform the role of the new measurement train, um, as it can travel at 125 miles an hour, fit in between passenger trains and not delay passenger vehicles. Covering over 100,000 miles a year, it can survey the entire mainline rail network in just four weeks. We're looking ahead now. We're, we're trying to pre-plan. We're not reacting to uh, faults. We're trying to predict where those faults are going to appear in the future. So it's moving into a digital age to help us be more efficient in what we do. Banks of sensors feed into the onboard computers, which are monitored by a team of technicians. You've got lasers. We've got gyros, we've got uh, inertial boxes for actually the speed we're moving. So every little bump, every little movement left and right is all outputted 
on here. From experience, the team know exactly what kind of faults to look out for. There's about 40 plus uh, devices underneath the train, which gives us the outputs in a digital format. We can actually record data at 125 miles an hour, so we can analyze the track defects that we're looking for. So we've got three main defects, uh, and all three of these can be liable to uh, derail a train, uh, which we're trying to prevent. So the first fault we're looking for is a bounce in the rails, kind of the roll in the rails. This bouncing effect gets worse with every passing train. Eventually, a freight train comes along. Their suspension isn't as good as a passenger train, so if left unchecked, it could bounce off the tracks. Uh, the second one is a twist fault, which is a left or right rail, which is raised slightly more than the other, which can cause a train to twist. This twisting and tilting effect can become so severe that it derails the train. Uh, and then the third one is the width of the track, the, the distance between the two rails. This distance, known as the gauge, should remain constant. Over time, ballast under the tracks can shift, causing the rails to move either closer or further apart. The job of this 125 is to make sure that faults like these are found and fixed before they cause problems. It's a demanding job, but it has its benefits. We've got a different view out the window every day. Uh, I've got a great delivery manager. <laughs> <laughs> we can be in Penzance one day, we can be in Aberdeen the next. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we get all over the country. This ability to troubleshoot while travelling at 125 miles an hour is vital to keeping the network flowing and, more importantly, keeping all of us safe. Now, something that literally throws you about may become something like a broken rail or a, a significant fault that we need to stop the train. And we stop the train and we literally we will phone the signalman and tell them they've got to block the line. And we put that information out to the maintenance teams who go out and repair the track. The new measurement train is proof that the 125 still has an important role to play. They've been the backbone of the intercity network for 40 years, and those in the know still rate these old workhorses. The 125 is the best train ever built, as far as I'm concerned. It was built when British built things, and the British built locomotives. It was, uh, it was designed by the, the guys on the drone board, the draftsmen, and it was built by engineers. Um, this day and age, I think, will be designed by a computer, built by a robot and the computer and the robot don't have to drive them, so, you know, I like these. A lot of things happen a lot quicker. We're covering two miles a minute, and your concentration level has to be spot on. You cannot let it waver. If your attention's distracted for a couple of seconds, you've, you've covered you know, a quarter of a mile. Them higher speed, you really have to be switched on. It's 125 mile an hour with your hair on fire. You get the feeling Tony quite likes these trains, and it's clear they're still capable of performing a vital role for the railway. And remember the tilting train that failed so spectacularly in 1981? Well, it turns out it has a legacy too. You can travel on advanced passenger trains in the UK to this very day. The Virgin Super Voyager trains run with active tilt systems that are facsimiles of the advanced passenger train tilt system. We seem to be very good at inventing a technology out here in the UK, developing it to a particular level, then giving it up and giving it to everybody else and saying, here are guys, you get on and, and do this and we'll go and bumble on and do something else instead. Great pity. The stopgap became the reliable workhorse, restoring our faith in rail travel. It gave us a high-speed train that served for more than 40 years. 40 years for another train to do 40 years as well as these have. I, I can't say it. I think the 125 was the first train that was really modern and comfortable and for everybody. It's been running every day at 125 miles an hour. Just imagine your Cortina car from the 1970s doing that on the M1 every day. It transformed the commuter belt delivering workers to cities across the country, fueling Britain's booming economy. The 125 enabled people to live a different kind of lifestyle. 
it deserves recognition as a national icon. They'll give another 20 years. They'll be certainly, I bet you they're here longer than I am. Uncovering a legendary hidden network, Rob Bell's walking Britain's lost railways from Sheffield to Manchester, new next on Channel 5. Whilst next over on Paramount Network, the Stephen King season kicks off with the Jack Nicholson classic, The Shining.